I'm here on behalf of Fellows um, to talk about well-being and productivity uh, with a focus in, on the office environment. Some of the things we're talking about can be, um, can be d discussed in relation to other in working environments as well, but the main focus of this talk is about the office environment. But we're going to focus on a couple of myths that I come across time and time again with regards to uh, employee productivity um, within, the U within the UK. Um, so a little bit about me, I, I'm a chartered ergonomist um, with the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. Most of the time you'll see a, a chartered ergonomist working in safety critical systems such as oil, gas, nuclear for example, where if human error occurs it normally leads to death and loss, losses of income. Um, so with, with ergonomics and human factors, safety critical systems Human factors and ergonomics is really well understood, but from my experience within offices, we don't see to see the same approach. Um, and one of the reasons is because it's not a safety critical system, and if there is human error of some form, it doesn't normally to lead to a massive disaster. But if we apply good ergonomics at the early stages of design, whether it's a safety critical system or simply an office, we can imp improve productivity and uh, an individual subjective well-being. I recently wrote a chapter in Creating a Productive Workplace that, um, edited by uh, Derek Clements Croom, who is well involved with the British Council of Offices. Well, I cover some of the things we're talking about today. So uh, this talk's going to cover the following areas. Uh, first of all, everyone understands the cost of absenteeism. We all talk about it all of the time. But what's the cost of presenteeism, and what is presenteeism? Um, the UK government have a definition for it, but I've done a lot of reading around this subject and there's some better definitions to explain what presenteeism is. Well-being and its connection with productivity. So I try to define what well-being is. It's used a lot, and especially its connection with health. Um, so I try to define what I believe well-being is based on some of my reading, and um, hopefully you can take some of that away. Um, it's really worked for me when speaking to designers and architects around the design of, of modern offices. The f especially from a productivity perspective in the office environment, um, the recent focus on collaboration at the expense of concentration. From a productivity standpoint, I see this is one of the biggest elements, not also from a productivity, but also from a subjective well-being perspective. If you cannot concentrate to do your tasks and it sustained distractions, that leads to negative subjective well-being and poor health potentially. So that's a really important subject I want to focus on. Some of the different forms of distractions from my experience working in office ergonomics. Um, I've been working in a 999 control centre recently, quite amazing work, what the guys have to do, and they're really having to concentrate, but interestingly, the focus from the designers was all collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. But when you observe the people doing their job, they, they couldn't concentrate. So. Um, some of the, the, the different forms of distraction that I come up against. And then four actions to help boost productivity you can take away from today's talk that can hopefully um, help you with well-being and productivity within your organisation. So, myth one uh, is the focus on collaboration uh, to increase productivity. That's the first one I want you to think about, and maybe you've got some examples. If you've got any examples you can share at the end, please jot them down now. I'd be happy to discuss them as a group. Um, but I see this as a, as, a, as a big myth that comes up, especially at the early stages of designs. A lot of designs at offices are based on fads and trends that they read in the media, not actually on user-centred design. And the next one is, if my employees at their desk, they'll be more productive. So a couple of things to think about as we go through this, go through this talk. So fellows, I'm not sure if any of you heard of fellows, but they manufacture office products. They did a study um, recently, in 2000, beginning of 2018, um, productivity in the workplace. And these are just some of their findings. Um, producti productivity levels fall as 30% of, of office workers call on their employees to do more. The average worker loses one and a half hours per day. And that's a really interesting number there. Um, if you think about, when, when, remember this number when we talk about presenteeism later on. And 60% of office workers believe their businesses have productivity issues. 
Now this is available on Fellows website. Um, if you contact Fellows, they can provide you more information about this study. Um, and then moving on to obviously uh, absenteeism and presenteeism, but really focused here on musculoskeletal disorders. We do hear a lot about stress and anxiety in the workplace, which is really, really a big topic, absolutely. But I don't hear as much focus, especially in the media potentially, around musculoskeletal disorders. Now, 8.9 million working days lost in 2016-17. Um, and this is the health and safety stats on this. So MSDs were generally going down to about 2011 and sort of plateaued off recently. Um, now, within the office environment, my thinking was this, is the, the amount of time people are sedentary for, the lack of movement in the modern office. Modern technology has robbed us of normal everyday movements. And if we sit still, that increases the likelihood of musculoskeletal disorders. So they've plateaued off, so there's still a lot of work to do with musculoskeletal disorders. So moving on to the cost of absenteeism, we all, everyone talks about absenteeism, most organisations measure it, uh, especially larger organisations. This is some work done by PwC uh, in 2013, 7% of GDP, 28.8 billion cost, so it's a big, big cost to the UK, and especially with a globalised economy, we need to be productive, we need to be, have all our employees at work working productively. But from a cost perspective, as I'll, I'll give you some references after this, and if ever you want more detail of references, please come and see me afterwards, and I'll be happy to share them with you. Absenteeism is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to a cost perspective, which I find, as an economist, really important to talk about. Some of the, unfortunately, it normally gets people listening if you focus on some of the costs. If you get, the, if you get that topic focused on, normally that can lead to improved well-being afterwards. But it's really the tip of the iceberg. Presenteeism, and this is the best picture I could find for <laughs> presenteeism. I did, hopefully no one said, I did actually steal this off the internet. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's the best picture I could find on presenteeism. The UK government define it um, as when you come into work with a cold or flu, which is highly likely at the moment with the amount of cold bugs going around. And they define it actually, if you look at their, their website, the government, if you type in UK Gov, presenteeism, they define it as the same cost as absenteeism. But a lot of my reading around this subject um, has shown it to be more, as we ought to come to discuss. But the term presenteeism means the suboptimal performance of those still at work, or might the better definition, which I use quite a lot, uh, reduce productivity at work due to health problems or other events, the key word there, that distracts one from full productivity. So think about those other events that are distracting us from full productivity. As I said, this is the, the reading I've done around this subject to back this, this statement up. So if you're interested, please come to me afterwards and I'll be happy to <coughs> take your email and send this on to you. But uh, work published in the UK estimates that lost productivity due to presenteeism is, is on average seven and a half times greater than productivity, productivity lost due to absenteeism. So at work, being distracted from your environment. Now, what we're going to do now is talk about well-being and its connection with productivity. And you can see how presenteeism comes into everyone's individual day. I mean, recently I was having to work in an open plan collaborative office for a day while I was working. I think I must have lost about two hours due to the main thing was this acoustic speech intelligibility, which we'll discuss. But presenteeism is a big cost and it's not truly understood or looked at by organisations, I believe. So moving on to oh, this, this whole event around well-being, so I wanted to give you my take on it. Um, now, this, this is the, well, the well-being definition that I use, um, is the balance point between an individual's resource pool and the challenges faced. Now, I see a lot of times of organisations focus on productivity, trying to get the last 1% out of their staff. If we constantly push to get the most out of people without truly understanding what well-being is, that only leads to high levels of presenteeism and potentially even exit from the company. But this is a, some work done by a lady <coughs> called Dodge um, at and, and Cardiff Metropolitan University. And she, and she tried to define well-being in her PhD, and this is her definition. So it's a balance between challenges and resources. Now, this is what a, a, a productive person looks like. They have enough resources at work and at home, don't forget, to better cope with the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So this is what we're trying to achieve, this balance between challenges and resources. Now, um, think, think about, I'll give you some examples. So from a physical perspective, so with physical, social and psychological elements of well-being, there are others such as financial which are really important, but she focused on these three areas. Physical, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, a big one in a modern office, especially with the amount of time people are being sedentary for. Lack of movement leads to higher levels of musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, the thermal environment, from the physical perspective, anyone working in a modern office, uh, issues with thermal environment, comes up time and time again. Um, <coughs> acoustics, which I'll touch on, um, not necessarily too much noise, but sometimes not enough background noise, which I'll explain. Um, and lighting, some examples of the physical elements. Uh, social, organisational culture, um, employee, partici employee participation during a change management process, uh, knowledge sharing within the organisation, uh, some examples of psychological uh, workload, control and description, uh, repetitiveness in the job or ambiguity in the job role. So there's some examples for you from the resources and, and challenges from the physical, social and psychological. But this is where we start to lead into problems, where the challenges start to outweigh the resources. Now, this is what normal life's like. We all have challenges every day, at home, at work. So in a, in a way, our well-being is doing this continuously, but, and we're trying to balance these two critical elements. Now, short-term imbalance can be coped with, and this can also go the other way, by the way. You can have, I've seen organisations in co a call centre I work with doing an investigation where they had a high level of absenteeism and people leaving the job. It's because they didn't have enough challenges they are under-challenged, so it's not always challenges outweighing resources. Sometimes it can be the other way as well. But where we lead to problems, this, this is okay just for a short period, but if it's sustained challenges, continuous challenges, so let's think of a, an example here. I've just started a new job, I've got uh, sciatica down my right leg, I'm not exactly sure why that is. I've reported it to my line manager who doesn't really understand musculoskeletal disorders. Maybe uh, on the first week I've got a really important presentation to do and I can't concentrate in the office because of poor acoustics. Maybe it's really hot as well and you're scared to raise your hand to the new manager. If this example is sustained for two, three weeks, a month, that's when a simple challenge, a simple distraction, like you go home every evening, and your other half asked you to do the washing up, for example. Not the best example, but um, a simple distraction at work or outside of work can put you over the edge. That's when you can't cope anymore. I've had enough. I haven't got enough resources to meet these challenges. This is what we want to try and avoid. Now, if we can apply a user-centered approach, and I'll, I'll explain some of these, how we do that at the end, but if we can really understand well-being as not and productivity is not trying to get the last 1% out of everyone. That approach is dangerous, and I've seen it fail time and time again. We need a balance between challenges and resources. Then hopefully we can bring them back into balance, then we've got a productive workforce. So that's Dodge et al, defining well-being. If you're interested in that paper, it's a fantastic paper, and she specialises in well-being um, and its connection with productivity. On the health side, I see a lot of organisations focus on health, which is great, but it's not necessarily correlated with positive subjective well-being. If you think about it, I could smoke 20 cigarettes a day, be overweight, have type 2 diabetes, but my challenges for me and resources could be in balance. So the focus on health is good, but don't necessarily think it's going to make a productive workforce. Okay? That's something I find that a lot of organisations focus on and then they scratch their heads while they still haven't got a productive workforce. Because it's not, health is very, very, very important, of, of course. But its connection with well-being is an interesting subject. So some of the consequences of poor subjective well-being. So we're at that sustained distraction point. Now, we haven't got a manager that understands the working environment. We can't really, we don't feel confident in raising our hand to report issues. That can lead to reduced concentration and poor performance, negative well-being, Ill health, this is normally the stage where HR, occupational health, get involved. Short-term absence, long-term absence, and potential exit from a company. 
this is something, uh, retaining talent is absolutely key in a globalised economy. So this is something we want to try and avoid. So this was a, um, a report done by the British Council of Officers, and it's a great organisation. If any of you are interested in these subjects, they do a lot of work around wellbeing and productivity. But um, they did a report looking at the business costs. Now, interestingly, 55% of the organisations that they worked with, 55% of their costs were the human factor, a massive element to the financial performance. But going back to what I said at the start, most organisations don't focus on the technical side. They don't focus truly on, on a human-centred design right from the start. And what happens, they normally focus on the technical elements of a, a new office design um, and leave the human element out. But then when it comes to budget concerns, the ergonomics or human factors tend to get put to one side in a non-safety critical system. So that difference between the, the safety critical systems and non-safety critical systems, I see the difference between this user-centred approach um, and the success of it. So what we need to do is a social technical, what we call in human factors, a social technical approach to organisational and system design. So 50% each side, can you actually say, I have designed this office or this environment or this system, taking into account 50% the human factor and 50% the technical. It's very rare that that happens. So, moving on to one of the myths about, we talked about um, being at the desk and presenteeism. Um, and how just because someone's at the desk, all of these distractions can affect their productivity. Now, the big one for me, and something that I can see organisations turn around their productivity overnight and helping to retain top talent, is this, the collaboration and concentration. Now, what I've seen due to, um, in the media, people reading on with the search engines nowadays, it's very easy to do a search and then design based on what you find. But in more recent times, the world has embraced a more open plan type office with space for collaboration and discussion. Who works in this kind of office here? Yeah, quite a large proportion of you. So this, in this example, the finance team are going to be located here. But the idea of someone said at the last minute, we need a collaboration zone. Because it's, it's a good thing, isn't it? We need to collaborate more. But bolting that right next to the finance team, probably not a good idea when it comes to speech intelligibility and acoustics, which we'll cover. But this focus on collaboration has, has been dangerous. So as we've come to discuss briefly here, it's been argued that this causes distractions, this focus on collaboration. And if it's sustained distractions, it can be acoustics, it can be visual distractions, people coming over, tapping on the shoulder, this leads to uh, effects on individuals' well-being and their productivity as well. So, concentration, the importance of concentration in the office is absolutely fundamental for a productive office environment. I can't emphasise this enough. But when you're thinking about design, can you actually concentrate on a, a task without being distracted? And we'll cover why this is important. So the ability to concentrate is, product, uh, is the foundation of a productive workplace. For high levels of productivity, we need high and sustained levels of concentration centred on the task being carried out. But when its concentration is broken, this can lead to uh, poor performance and ultimately negative well-being. Now, Albert Einstein, I, I, I was thinking about trying to trade, uh, trademark a word called the distraction index. I thought, that sounds like a good idea. I'll, I'll trademark that. But one morning I had this great idea, so I Googled it, and this chap beat me to it, unfortunately. Um, now, this is supposedly, he coined this term, and but he called it the distraction index, Albert Einstein. And he was trying to work out some quite complex things. Um, but, but he really needed to concentrate. But so do everyone in their day, in their work. They, you need to concentrate at different level, points of the day. But what he did, every time he was distracted, he would write down what distracted him and then design that out of his workspace. But we can't all do that, can we? Um, so how long do you think the average time in an open plan office, the average time before we get distracted. Any, any ideas? So Albert Einstein got to 42 minutes. What do you think the average person is? Very close. It's a bit more than that. It's actually 12 minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> this was a literature review um, done in 2013. And I, I can give you the reference to this as well. 
But the average time they found in this literature review was 12 minutes and 40 seconds. So that's not long, is it? If we're trying to do some really concentrate on a task and we're distracted every 12 minutes and 40 seconds, how they come up with the 40 seconds, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, 12 minutes. Um, but even an interruption they found of two seconds, only two seconds, someone tapping you on the back or shouting your name across the office or just, do you want a tea or a coffee? Just when you're at that perfect level of concentration, that's enough for people to lose the thread on a difficult or complex task. Average time elapsed before returning to work, I find this, on the same task, 25 minutes. Do you know you get distracted and suddenly you find yourself doing something else? And you think, what's I doing? John, John, what was I doing a minute ago? You need someone to remind you. Um, so that's quite a common one. I, I, can, I, can, I can see that. But really interesting, average time required after resuming a difficult task to get back into the same level of intense concentration. You know when you're just at that level of concentration where everything's flowing, you've just worked it out and suddenly you get asked for if you want a cup of coffee. That's enough to knock you off on your concentration process. Percentage of tasks that are interrupted when people work in an open plan office, 63%. So you can see presenteeism here coming in, can't you? This is th these distractions, coming to work with a cold or a flu, but also these continuous distractions. This could also be from a musculoskeletal disorder as well. So what do we need to do about this? Balance, clever. If you can do one thing, look at your office and think, is there, can, is there a balance between these two things? Hand on heart, is there a balance between collaboration and concentration? So strategy to improve collaboration can be ineffective if it's at the expense of concentration. I'll show you some studies in a moment that back everything up I'm saying. The accomplishment of individual concentrated tasks and high quality teamwork are both key elements in organisational performance. Think of Einstein trying to concentrate. Where can staff go to collaborate, concentrate, meet with smaller or larger groups, make that private phone call or write down an idea or eat their lunch. Where can they go to do these things? Not all organisations are large organisations. Some, even most of the UK economy is made up of small businesses. But it's just the awareness with management that this ability to concentrate is absolutely vital for productivity. So an analogy I would share with you that works quite well that people seem to get is the, um, the analogy is the coming together of soloists in an orchestra who need to spend hours practising alone before coming together to rehearse and perform. If, you're off, off your, if your office or where you work can allow for that analogy, that's going to help. One of the things that's going to help with well-being, obviously there's lots of elements from the physical, social and psychological on that balance that affect an individual's well-being and, and productivity. But one of the biggest ones I find is people generally want to go to work to do a good job. They want to be able to concentrate, make sure they have the space and ability to do that. Um, so some recent studies uh, to back this up. Gensler, the largest architectural firm in the world, and again, I can share all this with you afterwards. Please come up to me if you need to. Um, they looked at, in 2006, Gensler did a study, and the results were more collaboration, more collaboration. Now, to be fair to them, they've done a U-turn, and in t not that recent, but in 2012, they actually come out of a new report saying that we need to spend more time concentrating. So they asked 90,000 people in 155 companies in 10 industries, so it's a good quality study. Workers say open plan offices make it more difficult to concentrate. And they value time spent being able to concentrate. So that was really interesting. Still case, massive organisation, manufacture chairs and office equipment. Collaboration at work is vital for creation. In excess, it's a killer. So globally, too much, their, their, their study found globally too much interaction, not enough privacy, is taking a whole heavy toll on workers. 95% workers said they need quiet to concentrate. So some examples there of some studies that back up what I'm saying. So from, from, my, um, from my experience uh, looking at this, um, some of the things I've... I've seen time and time again. The first one, who has problems with acoustics here or noise in your open plan office? Hands up. Okay, there we go. It's pretty, it's just a good result there. Now, it's normally in the open plan office, and I've learned this, I've been working with an acoustician 
for a number of years now where I've learned this from. Um, but it's what, what the important thing is for concentration in an open plan office is the, the word speech intelligibility. So can you understand someone's concentration when you're concentrating? Even if they're talking about what they had for lunch three months ago, the human nature is to listen in. And it breaks that concentration. Remember that even two second distraction, how that affects productivity? So normally in offices, if you did a well-being questionnaire, it comes up, people have got, there's too much noise. Now nine times out of 10, it's not there's too much noise, it's normally too quiet in the office. And when it's quiet, you can understand conversation. So just bear that in mind. There's a bit more to office acoustics than that, but acoustics tra noise travels very efficiently at overhead height. The biggest bang for your buck in office acoustics is the ceiling tiles, because they absorb the most energy. Uh, I was, the, the 999 control centre I was working in recently, we did an investigation, and 90% of the sound was being reflected and affecting the ability of people to concentrate. But generally, it's where someone's trying to concentrate and they can understand the conversation. So there are techniques you can use to increase the background noise. Does anyone ever go to the coffee shop sometimes if they want to concentrate, just to get away? And it's a ratting in the background, isn't it? You can't understand someone's conversation. So if, if you're concerned about acoustics, it's not always that there's too much noise. It's normally that it's too quiet and noise travels very efficiently above head height. It's that distraction. How far does noise travel before you can understand it? So acoustics, office acoustics is a big one, and it's very rarely thought of or discussed at the early stages of an office redesign. Uh, discomfort from musculoskeletal disorders, a very a big one that I find time and time again when carrying out observation and interviews with, with people and through questionnaires and through my reading and looking at obviously the HSE statistics. One of the biggest issues here is the amount of time we're spending sedentary. How long has everyone been sitting for today? Too long. Too long. If you want to fidget, please be my guest. If you want to fidget, stand up, take advantage of it. The process of sta simply standing up is one of the best things you can do. But not necessarily staying standing up. The movement between the two is absolutely key for, for long-term health. And reducing a number of chronic diseases, one, of, one being an example of is type 2 diabetes, but also musculoskeletal disorders such as lower back discomfort, aches and pains. Just normal everyday movements is what we're looking for. Uh, distractions from co-workers. Uh, I did a work, some work for a large search engine a few years ago and how they get around it is that when people are concentrating they wear red noise cancelling headsets. Everyone knows then, don't distract them, they're trying to write, do some important work that works, but it has to come down from the top. The organ management needs to understand that people need to concentrate and collaborate, not just collaborate all day. And then the thermal environment, as you can feel in here at the moment, it's quite hot, isn't it? So it's quite hard to get the thermal environment right for the human um, to be able to concentrate as well. That's a really complex one to get that right. Anyway, they're the main ones that come up. So, summary then, we can go to ask you guys some questions and see if anyone to understand your experiences of this. I put together four actions to help uh, boost workplace productivity. The first one, um, promote normal everyday movements around the office. It doesn't have to be focused on exercise. Normal everyday movements. And a book I'd recommend you to read on this is a book called Sitting Kills, Moving Hills by a lady called Joanne Vernikos. She's the ex-NASA scientist um, who basically studied astronauts in microgravity. And basically she found that when you're in microgravity, you rapidly age. But similar process happens when you sit down all day. And she comes up basically 33 to 36 times a day, she worked out you need to go up and down between sitting and standing to have normal aging. But it's a great book, you can read it in one sitting. But normal everyday movements around the office, getting up to go to the coffee machine, getting up to go to an area where we can concentrate, taking the stairs instead of the lift, all of these things are going to help reduce distractions and also with mus musculoskeletal disorders. Obviously, provide good quality ergonomic equipment um, is really important to make sure when people are at their desk, they can adopt good quality posture, um, which can reduce the risk of distractions. 
ensure your office design is, ba is a balance between collaboration and concentration. Hopefully I've made a good argument for that here, balance between these two. And the last one, um, and something I see all of the time with workspace design, and you don't see this again in safety critical systems as much, but the design of a new workspace based on a questionnaire or a focus group is quite dangerous. Because what people say they do and what they actually do are two complete different things. Henry Ford supposedly said if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. People didn't know what they, they, want, what they need. So ensure design of workspace are based on what people actually do. So if someone's coming to you saying, I need a beanbag, well, why is that? Let's observe them and interview them and watch what they do in their job. See if that's what they actually need. So design workspaces based on what people actually do rather than what they say they do. That last point comes off what we've been talking about a little bit, but I thought it was really important to get that in because a lot of modern office designs are based on fads and trends and what people think they need instead of observing and interviewing people and carrying out field research to find out what it is they actually need. So... Uh, Hopefully I've really explained my take on well-being and productivity. It's not about getting the last 1% out of everyone. It's that balance between challenges and resources. I'd recommend to read that paper, Dodge et al., 2012, um, defining well-being. And also we talked about uh, presenteeism, more costly than absenteeism. When people are at their desk, can they concentrate? It's not always about resilience training. We're human beings. We get distracted. Let's try and design some of those distractions out or at least understand it from the human's perspective. And also, I would say is that the biggest thing uh, we talked about is those regular, normal, everyday movements around the office can help with concentration. Are there places to go to concentrate and collaborate um, instead of just working in that same space for this, on the same tasks? Mm -hmm.